Okay, see, so it's time. So we start this afternoon session. So we, we have the junior talks, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Alexander Hobb uh, from Wisconsin University. And he's going to speak about Milner fiber consistency of the formations of arbitrarily singular hypersurfaces. All right. Thanks, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Let's let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, so first, let me tell you some things that all of you already know. Um, if we have a, a germ of a holomorphic function at the origin, uh, we have this, this thing we can do where we, we look at its representative on just a small enough open ball around the origin. And then we you know, we zoom in much farther potentially sort of on the source to avoid our fibers kind of meeting the boundary sphere in any bad way. And then we're left with just sort of smooth fibers, except maybe the one over the origin. And we, we throw away this smooth fiber, this, sorry, this potentially non-smooth fiber over the origin. And this gives us the Milner vibration of F at the origin. And we'll denote its fiber throughout the talk by F sub F. And so, so we have here um, sort of, because it's a vibration here, you know, there's only one smooth fiber that we have locally. So we have this situation where there's one contractible singular fiber and one smooth fiber that, that has some sort of homological structure. And, and uh, there is some sort of relationship between these two. Um, so, so in particular, the, the homological structure of F of the of the fibers of the smooth fiber is given somehow by the singular structure of the the singular fiber in a way that's not totally understood. So for you know for example we saw last week this this Milner Kato Matsumoto result that uh, gives this some sort of pretty con crude control of the uh, of the smooth fiber based on the singularities that says the uh, the dimension of the singularities controls. Uh, you know, just the uh, the degrees the the homology is allowed to appear in, and so so we're going to want to sort of see if we can uh, get get some better results than this ultimately. Um, and so the way the way we kind of uh, try to tackle these questions often is we we take our our function and we we perturb it a little bit, and we hope that we get something a bit better out that might be easier to study. And, you know, in order to do this, of course, we need to know that the perturbation actually preserves the structure we want to look at. So we want to know in some sense, we perturb our function a little bit and, and somehow we still get information about that same smooth fiber. And I've, you know, right now I've left this question deliberately a little vague. This could mean on the level of, uh, you know, diffeomorphism type, it could mean on the level of homotopy type, it could just mean on the level of homology. But, uh, you know, I want to sort of, review some situations in which this is already known to, to kind of happen. And so the first one is uh, if, if our uh, hypersurface that our function is defining has just an isolated singularity at the origin, in this case, it's not too hard to show that actually um, the, uh, a perturbation will, will still give us sort of the same nearby smooth fiber in some sort of sphere. And this is, this is the, the thing that lets us you know, really figure out the homology of this Milner fiber just by perturbing to a, to a, a, a nearby Morse function. So we talked about this. We we break up the uh, the critical point into a bunch of Morse critical points, and and somehow their number tells us everything we want to know about the uh, the homology. So that's what happens in the isolated case. And then you know, for um for a long time, there's been kind of interest in in being able to do these same things for non-isolated singularities, right? If you have a positive dimensional critical locus on your hypersurface that F is cu cutting out, um, what can you say? And, and you know, for non-isolated singularities, it's definitely not true in general that a perturbation will preserve the, uh, the, 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 the Milner fiber. Um, so so one, one construction that sort of uh, gives us some results along this line is, is due to David Massey, and, and this is these invariants called lay numbers that are, that are defined in terms of these um, you know, intersection multiplicities with, with uh, polar varieties, and these give some sort of uh, higher dimensional generalization of the Milner number. And, and so Massey has this result that if you take a perturbation that preserves the lay numbers at the origin, 
you can um, get some sort of consistency in your Milner fiber. And depending, you know, depending on the size of the singular set, you can get this consistency homologically, homotopically, or even you know, up to diffeomorphism in, in sort of different situations. But you know, this um, so this is a pretty good result. It lets us you know, do, do some kind of computations, but it's, it's a bit more rigid than the things we know in the isolated case because this, this requirement of preserving the lay numbers is somehow the same, you know, in the isolated case, this is the same as saying that the, the Milner number should re remain constant. So we can't do the same kind of thing where we, where we break up and, and get um, different Morse points coming off. The, the, it, this is too rigid for that. So, so that's one sort of attempt that's been made. And another that I, that I thought I'd mention is, um, you know, I guess the, the most general version of this is to, due to Javier Fernandez de Bobadilla, sort of building off things that had been, had been done by Rude Pelican and uh, really many other people, probably too many to list, but you know, there's this machinery that was worked on in the, uh, the 80s and 90s. And, and then I think Bobadilla's sort of big paper on this came out in around 2005 or so of this theory of finite extended co-dimension with respect to some ideal. So if you have some sort of ideal that you know is, um, is, is not too bad with respect to F and you perturb through that ideal, uh, then again, you get sort of a, this consistency of the smooth fibers. And this lets us morsify in the sense that we split off Morse points. Yeah. Um. Uh, does this mean the perturbations of the function come from this ideal or uh, yeah so it's, your perturbation is such that your function is in this ideal and every sort of nearby function is also in this ideal does this make sense yes okay thanks cool yeah so so this is this is the requirement and, and if you get this you have this consistency of the milner fiber but um this this very much only sort of lets you make things better for the isolated singularities, right? You can split off zero dimensional points, but everything else is, is sort of required to be fixed by the, this finiteness condition. Um, so so these, are, these are the uh, kind of main results that I'm aware of in this direction uh, so far. And I wanted to give another, another sort of contribution in this genre. And, and for that, um, just a little bit of setup. So we'll, we'll take a... Um, a germ of a holomorphic function, and now we add in u extra variables that we'll think of as parameters. So we think of this as a deformation of f, right? We require that when these last u parameters are all zero, we get our, our little f back. Um, and, and we'll we'll call the projection to the parameter space pi just, just to keep track of those parameters. And then we'll we'll look at the the critical locus of this deformation. So the, the partial derivatives of this big F with respect only to the non-parameter variables. And, you know, finally, we'll, we'll say the discriminant is, 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 is delta, so this is just the image under f cross pi of, the, of this critical locus. And so the, the answer we get is that if this critical locus is flat over c to the o of the origin, and I'll say more about that condition in a second, but, you know, as long as this condition is satisfied, then, actually we get, we can do sort of a similar thing to the original Milner vibration, right? We, we start with some representative uh, on a small open ball, and then we zoom in farther, you know, in our, uh, to, to a small disk D delta in our um, target space, and we zoom in farther in our parameter space, so we're allowed to make our parameters uh, smaller. And then we, 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 we end up with, okay, this restricted function, and now again, we throw away sort of the singular fibers, right? So we, so we restrict over the complement of this, this discriminant or the closure of this discriminant if we're being really careful. And the result is that this gives us a smooth locally trivial vibration. And this is sort of the result we want because this gives us, um, you know, for example, the uh, constancy of the diffeomorphism type of, of the uh, Milner fiber, right? You know, if you have the, the smooth fiber of, of little f, is going to be the fiber of this larger vibration. So you can move the parameters around slightly and you'll still get the same smooth fiber. So this, this will let us study this smooth fiber by, by perturbing it a little in, in the way we want to do. And so, okay, I promised I'd tell you a little bit more about this notion of flatness. And to do this, we need to be a little careful about what we mean exactly by this, this critical locus of, of 
big F cross pi, right? So, you know, when I, when I talked about the um, singularities of our, our hypersurface determining the, the homological structure of the Milner fiber, you know, even in the isolated case, maybe, uh, you know, this seems potentially a little bit suspect because set theoretically, right? If you have an isolated singularity, set theoretically, your critical locus is just a point. This is the definition. Um, so when I talk about the critical locus determining the structure of the Milner fiber, what I really mean is to consider it as uh, a scheme or, or, you know, a complex analytic space. So, so you know, this, this means that I'm going to somehow be keeping track of these, uh, these nilpotents that can arise, right? So for example, if F is Y squared minus X cubed, and then of course the Jacobian ideal will just be X squared Y, I wanna regard this as, you know, I wanna regard the, the critical locus cut out by this ideal, not just as a point, but somehow as this point that has this function x that is not itself zero, but squares to zero. And, and we visualize this in algebraic geometry as this little bit of sort of infinitesimal fuzz. So we have a point with some amount of fuzz, and this, this remembers all of the structure of this Milner algebra in the isolated case. And so we can, from this, you know, we, we know the Milner number gives us all we need to know about the homology of the smooth fiber. So, so somehow here, the, the scheme structure of, of the singular set that we get from this Jacobian ideal tells us everything about the Milner fiber. And so sort of by analogy, uh, we, we hope to find some, some sort of thing like this also in the non-isolated case. We hope that if we keep track of these, these, these nilpotents in this non-reduced structure, uh, something, something good will happen. We'll be able to say more about the, the structure of the Milner fiber. Um, and so, okay, that's, that sort of scheme structure and then my pitch for why, why you should care about scheme structure. And then this notion of flatness sort of ties into this. So this is a scheme theoretic notion of what it means for a family of things to be consistent. Um, so first, just a, some, some real dry algebra background, a map of rings is flat if, if tensor you know, over, over the one by the other is an exact functor. And it's always right exact. So this is really about left exactness. And then if you have a map of locally ringed spaces, um, you know, so for example, schemes, for example, complex analytic spaces, um, you know, you just say a map is flat at a point if the corresponding map of local rings in the opposite direction is flat. Uh, nothing particularly exciting so far. And so just to, to, to keep things concrete, in our case, you know, we had this requirement that the critical locus of F cross pi be flat. This is just to say, take this map of convergent power series rings and uh, check that it's flat, you know, check that the, uh, the T1 through TU form a regular sequence on this guy, right? This is, this is all we're asking for. Um, and so that's, that's sort of what's going on algebraically. Geometrically, as I mentioned, this is this notion of what it means to have a family or deformation of, of schemes or sheaves or analytic spaces or whatever you want. And the reason for this is, um, so I, I learned about this, this perspective uh, from a paper of here in Naka, and this seems to be the perspective here in Naka likes. I put this question mark because I'm not sure if it's actually completely originally due to him or, or he got this idea from somewhere else. But uh, you know, it's not actually too difficult to show that flatness at a point is equivalent to the local triviality of the norm normal cone to the fiber over the tangent cone to the base, right? So you, you start with this, uh, you know, like you look at whatever um, point in the, in the target you want and you look at the fiber to that and you sort of straighten things out in directions perpendicular to this. And you should end, what you should end up with is just a, uh, just uh, actually a product. Um, and so this is equivalent to flatness. And you know, we've, we've talked a little about um, tangent cones in some of the lectures here, and this is very much the same construction, but with the uh, normal bundle instead of the tangent space. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's that kind of geometric idea. Right, and, and I should say that algebraically, um, the, the way you define this is through some sort of associated graded uh, algebra with respect to the ideal defining your point in, 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 in the base. Um, so that's, that's just some, some fun geometric intuition for flatness. Also what comes in handy is if you're, if you're going to a smooth one dimensional base, then actually you can sort of uh, read off flatness or failure of flatness very easily just by looking at the uh, components 
of your, of your source and making sure that none of them is mapped to a point. So by component, I mean an irreducible component, which is you know, uh, just an irreducible component, or an embedded component, which is sort of, um, you know, the definition is that it's an irreducible component of the support of some section of the structure sheaf, which is to say it's, it's um, an irreducible component of some set where some piece of fuzz lives. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example actually now. Um, so, okay, first let's, let's have an example of a non-flat map. So, so here I have this, this uh, complex analytic space cut out in, in three, 3D space by, by these, these three functions, x times z, y times z, and z squared. And you know, when we cut out by x times z and y times z, we're left over with this, this plane union, this z axis. And then when we cut out by z squared, we get rid of that z axis, but somehow because we got rid of z squared and not z, we're left with this, this little tuft of the z axis, this little infinitesimal tuft left over. And so this, this point where that tuft lives, this is an embedded component. And, and because this is being mapped down to a single point, your map is not flat. And so this is somehow saying that, you know, our fibers here, you know, our fiber over the, uh, over the origin is, um, it's a line with, with this fat point on it. And this fiber not over the origin is, is just this line. And so even though the fibers are set theoretically the same, uh, we're somehow saying there's an inconsistency here because here we have this bit of fuzz and here we don't. So this is a map that is not flat. On the other hand, um, you know, here's an example of a map that is flat. So now we, we, we again have this plane, but we, we sort of have this parabola meeting it. And you know, if you want to, um, to think about this, this normal cone to the fiber perspective, you can sort of imagine taking this parabola and sort of straightening it out again in this perpendicular direction. And so you can sort of see that you, uh, what you do when you do this is, is to squish kind of the parabola down to a plane. And so you end up with just you know, a plane with a fat line into it that is this parabola you've, you've squished down. And, and, and this is actually a product of, of this fiber over the origin here with, um, with, with the, uh, the base. And so this is flat. And, you know, you can see here this consistency of away from the origin, we have a, a line at a point separately. And at the origin, we have a, a line with a, one point of fuzz and somehow flatness says these are allowed to be the same thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just sort of some, some intuition there for what we're talking about when we talk about flatness. And just an aside on the isolated case, um, if, if our uh, original function defines an isolated singularity, then you know, it's not too hard to check um, that, well, you know, the critical locus will be a complete intersection. And so just for dimensional reasons, the, this critical locus in the family will always be flat over, over the parameter space. And this explains um, or gives one explanation for why the algebraic number, Milner number should be the same as this Morse theoretic one where we just define it to be the number of Morse points we get when we perturb a little, the, uh, the, this flatness somehow gives us this consistency where it says, okay, we had a point with some amount of fuzz uh, when the parameters were zero. And then we perturb, we perturb to these Morse points that all have multiplicity one. They, they all lack fuzz. And somehow the number has to be the same because of this flatness. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just an aside on the isolated case. And then, okay, let me remind you of this theorem again. So what this is saying is really that um, if, if we have this, this family of, of functions and the critical loci are varying consistently in the sense given by flatness, if they're consistent as, consistent as schemes, then the smooth fibers vary consistently as well. So this is, this is sort of a win for our idea that the, the scheme structure of the critical locus should somehow control the, uh, the, the homological structure of the smooth fiber. Um, and let's see, how are we doing? We're doing pretty well on time. So let me give you some idea of how this theorem is, is proved actually. Basically the idea is that we want to apply Tom's first isotopy lemma. And, and in order to do that, you know, the, uh, what it really boils down to is showing that these um, smooth fibers of F times pi are going to be transverse to this, uh, this boundary sphere to this, this ball of radius epsilon. And the way we do that is to show that this 
um, you know, this, this requirement of the critical locus being flat over the parameter space, um, this is the same as saying if we have a, a vector field such that um, the vector field is everywhere tangent to the smooth fibers of little f. So if we have a, have a vector field sort of just in c to the n plus one, then we can, we can make a lift of this um, so that uh, the, the, this, this lift is everywhere tangent to the smooth, smooth fibers of big F. And, and the, the lift, of course, restricts um, to, to our little vector field. And so this, this lets us basically take vector fields that are witnessing the transversality we have to show the existence of the Milner vibration you know, when the parameters are zero and, and sort of uh, lift that transversality statement um, to, to the nearby values of the parameters. So yeah, that's, that's the proof. Um, and I thought I'd close off with just an example of how to use this theorem in practice. So we have a, um, a function x cubed plus x y squared z. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you can sort of see what it is. It's not terribly exciting. I've just taken a Whitney umbrella and I've stuck a plane through it. Um, and, and so you can show, you know, the actual use of the theorem uh, occurs pretty early on and then the rest is, you know, some other stuff. But, you know, you can show that if you, really, if you put any, you know, if you put a different parameter here, x squared plus y squared z minus s times x minus t, you know, if you have a deformation like this uh, with, with two parameters, you know, you can just plug this into, uh, you know, Macaulay 2 or Singular or Oscar, or whatever your favorite computer algebra system is, and, and check that this is flat. And, and then, you know, here I've sort of chosen to restrict to a, to a one parameter family just to make the pictures a little easier and, you know, um, avoid extraneous baggage. So, so our, our hypersurface looks like this. And, you know, if we look at what the critical locus of this is, set theoretically, it's just, um, you know, it's just a pair of lines crossing. Right, it, it's, it's very simple. But somehow if we look again at the scheme structure that I'm claiming should be important, we see there's a little more going on. So we have you know, this, this vertical line here, um, you know, set theoretically is just a line, but scheme theoretically it has some sort of fuzz of, of multiplicity for living all along it. And this, this other, this more horizontal line, this is, this is really just a reduced line. And then we have sort of two pieces of fuzz living at the origin. So we have, a, we have an embedded component here at the origin. And if we take this perturbation that I've, that I've already said and perturb a little, we end up with some sort of splitting of, of, this, of this structure. So we, we get two lines um, with, with fat points, you know, down here at, at y equals uh, z equals zero. And we get one thing that looks sort of like the graph of z equals one over y squared here. And you know, you can really see here somehow, at least in retrospect, the um, you know, the the things we get out of this deformation kind of already living inside this 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 um this critical locus here, right? This this multiplicity four is like two of those are coming from these vertical lines, and two of these are coming from this, you know, this guy which is coming together with multiplicity two as we bring t back to zero. And, and this horizontal guy is, is really just coming from, from down here. And you know, these, these two points of fuzz are this guy here and this guy here. So, so somehow this lets us, for one thing, uh, kind of visually verify that, that flatness is happening. And for another, you know, leads to the question, you know, could we have, if we were really smart, could we have seen this already without actually cooking up the deformation? That this is, this is one thing we could break into. But, um, but anyway, uh, once, once we're here, then we use techniques of Dirk basically to, uh, to finish the job. So we, we express this as some sort of shifted relative homology. And, and then we, we use the fact that this breaks up as a sum across each critical value. So we can sort of compute it locally. And you know, these two lines with the fat points, these are just D and affinity singularities. You can, you can sort of check this directly. Um, so each, each of them gives us a Z sum end in degree two. And then finally, we have this part over the origin that's, that's smooth. And you know, locally, it's just um, you know, the, the, the fiber of our, of our function that, that, that this uh, critical locus sits inside is just two smooth surfaces meeting transversely. So, so locally, this looks like an A infinity singularity. 
Um, but but it has some topology also. So it's it's given by these equations, as, as I mentioned, x equals t and y squared z equals 4t squared. And we've we've moved t to a small non-zero value. And so we can we can then see that the nearby fiber is homotopic to a circle bundle over you know this thing that is also homotopic to a circle. And we inspect the monodromy and, and we see that it's trivial, and we, we find that actually it's a torus, and we compute the relative homology. And this gives us z sum ends in degrees one and two. And th then we can just put things all together and we arrive at this homology of the Milner fiber of, of this guy. So yeah, this is, this is one example of, of how, to, how to maybe use this. Uh, you know, the actual computation is maybe not the most interesting part, but there it is. Um, all right, and uh, we're, we're basically out of time, but just some sort of questions for the future. Um, one is how do we find interesting deformations satisfying the flatness criteria? You know, you hand me your favorite function. How can I find a nice way to, to break it up or to conclude that it can't be broken up further? Um, is the, another is, is there a way to read from the scheme structure of this critical locus where the Milner fiber or the transversal Milner fiber will change? You know, for example, can we, can we cook up a Whitney stratification of, of our um, fiber of the origin just by looking at the, the scheme structure. Um, sort of more pie in the sky, more long term, is there a way to just, you know, look at the critical scheme over the origin and read directly from some sort of scheme theoretic invariance the, the homology of the Milner fiber in the same way that we can do in the isolated case? And then, of course, lastly, um, just generalizing this to other settings, you know, complete intersection singularities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, all right, that's, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. Um, yeah. Okay. Any question, comment? Uh, so suppose you have a deformation of F mm -hmm. where the critical locus is flat. Mm -hmm. um, can you, I'm wondering about how you can detect that. So let's suppose that the, the dimension of the critical set over Y is, doesn't change. I'm just worried about embedded components at the origin, which we don't want to see appear. Um, can you say that they don't appear, provided that when you blow up the ideal that defines the critical set, uh, it has no components to the exceptional divisor that project to the origin? And if that is true, it's the same thing as saying that a the relative polar curve is empty, I think. I mean, this, sorry. Um, I'm not totally sure. This is, this is, this is sort of a, uh, an algebra geometric question about the nature of flatness that, that maybe I should know the answer to. But off the top of my head, I don't. Um, Gotcha. So you you have this condition of flatness, mm -hmm. and uh, in certain sense you can test that condition. But another question is to describe the set of flat deformations, and to look at certain questions: Is the deformation space finite dimensional? Yes or no? Is it smooth? Uh, what is its structure? So I expect it of future questions for you. Sure. And there is, you know, originally when I was trying to, to prove that something like this would be true, I did sort of start out trying to, to take this kind of a, an approach of, you know, proving things about the deformation space and somehow ran into technical difficulties. There are, you know, there are ways that I think I was doing it wrong that maybe I'll spare you all the discussion of, but, um, you know, at the very least, the most naive thing you could do is, is runs into trouble. Um. I have also a question. For sure. So when you have only one parameter, so on the, when the codomain is one dimensional mm -hmm. and smooth, so it is well known that uh, you have flatness if and only if the parameter is a non-zero divisor. Yes. So when you have dimension K or dimension U in your case, do you know if it is equivalent to the fact that the parameters T1, Tk form a regular sequence? 
Yes, this is this is true. If you uh, you know if your if your prim if your if your base is is this regular local ring, then flatness over the regular local ring, uh, you know, at this with respect to this this maximal ideal is exactly this. Uh -huh. Let's recall. Okay, thank you. Another question. Yes, actually, I was going to ask you about the last feature problem you listed. So do you have any thoughts on the case where you have a function defined on a variety in general? Right. Do I have any thoughts? I mean, I so I threw this in here, um, you know, sort of with the expectation that maybe this would be kind of crucial to doing uh, to, to sort of carrying this perspective over to, to complete intersection spaces, actually, because, you know, I thought maybe we could cut down one by one and then, you know, use this theory on a variety. But in terms of what the theory on, the, on a variety itself would actually look like, I'm less sure, you know, it's, it's I imagine you would want to do some sort of uh, flatness in a stratified sense and, and define some sort of scheme structure from this. But, yeah, I, I don't... Um, I haven't given it deep thought beyond that. For complete intersection, you will have anyhow the problem that for non-isolated singularity, the vibration is not good defined. Right, right. So somehow, you know, in any case, this this technique of sort of starting with the Milner vibration over, um, you know, you know, for for a function defining your singularity. And then expanding will run into this difficulty for exactly the reason you say. So you know you might have to start with some sort of hypothesis, like you know, say you say you already have a Milner vibration, can you expand it to, to some sort of larger family, something like this? Okay, so let's thanks Alex again. <laughs> okay, just a few minutes. We we'll start the second talk.
Okay, so let's start the second talk of today, of this afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Caroline de Lima Pereira from the Federal University of Sao Carlos. And she's going to speak about the Bruce Roberts numbers of a function on an isolated complete intersection singularity. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, I would like to thanks for this opportunity to talk about my, my work. Well, the title of this presentation is the Bruce Roberts number of a function on an isolated complete intersection singularity. But I will, I will consider only a particular case. So here I will talk about only isolated hypersurface singularity. Okay. And it, it is a joint work with Nuno Balesteros, Orefis Okamoto, and Tomazella. Okay. Well, in this presentation, I will talk about three numbers. The Milner number of an analytic function germs, the Bruce Roberts number, and the relative Bruce Roberts number. So first, I will talk about the Milner number. Uh, we consider the ring o ON and the ring of the analytic function germs from, C from CN at zero to C, okay? And the Milner number of an analytic function germ is equal to this dimension. The dimension as a C vector space of this quotient, O n over Jacobian ideal of F, okay? Well, the R group is the group of the filmorphisms in C n, and with this group, we have an equivalence relation in O n. So two function germs, F and J, are or equivalence when exists an element in R satisfying this condition. Okay, and we know the, the Milner number of a function germ F is finite, if and only if F is R finitely determinant, and the Milner number of F of a function germ F is finite, if and only if F has isolated singularity, and the Milner number of F is the number of the critical points of immersification of F, okay? So now about the Bruce Roberts number. This number was defined by Bruce and Roberts and they considered a, a, a reduced analytic variety X. And to calculate this number, we use the set of vector fields in CN that are tangent to X. And we denote this set by theta x, okay? So theta x is the set of the elements in theta n that satisfy, satisfies this condition for any element for any element in this ideal ix. And this ideal ix is the ideal of the analytic function germs that, uh, that vanish on x, okay? Well, so to calculate this set is not so easy. And now I will present two examples. So the first, we consider X, the hypersurface determined by this function germ, okay? And by definition, a vector field C belong theta X, even only if satisfies this condition, okay? So we have this relation between the coordinates of the vector field and the function germ that defines the hypersurface, okay? So we are looking for the vector field in theta three, such that there exists an element in ON satisfying this condition, okay? So to, to calculate the theta X, in this case, we need to calculate this CZG CZG of these elements and project it on the three first coordinates, okay? Uh, the second example, I consider a variety determined by two function germs, phi1 and phi2, okay? And by definition, a vector field belongs theta x even only if satisfies this condition for phi, phi1 and phi2, okay? So, uh, we have this relation between the coordinates of the vector field 
and the function germs that defines the variety. Okay. Okay. Uh, and here we consider the partial derivatives of phi one and phi two. Um, so in this case, we are looking for for the back, for the vector fields in theta three that that such that there exist these elements satisfying this condition. Okay. So in this case, we need to calculate two CZGs. Okay. The first I I call T1, and we consider the partial derivatives of a phi one. And the second, T2, we consider the partial derivatives of a phi two. Okay. And to conclude, we project the three the three first coordinates of T1 and T2. Okay. And we obtain respectively T1 prime and T2 prime. And the theta x is equal to this intersection. Okay. Well, it is not easy to calculate the theta x. And we use the software singular to, to make this CZG. And I think you also can use Oscar. Okay. So continue. Uh, the Bruce Roberts number of f with respect to x is equal to this dimension, the dimension as a C vector space of this quotient. Okay. And now uh, an example. So, okay, here we abbreviate I8S means isolated hypersurface singularity. So in this example, we consider the isolated hypersurface singularity determined by this function germ. And we calculated the theta x, in this case is generated by these vector fields. Okay. We consider this function germ. So we calculate the ideal df theta x. And in this case, the Bruce Roberts number of f with respect to x is equal to one. Okay. Well, this number generalizes the Milner number for a singular source, because if we consider the set x equal to cn, we, ha we have that this ideal ix is equal to zero ideal. So in this case, theta x is equal to theta n, and we have the equality between these numbers, the Bruce Roberts number and the Milner number of f. The Rx group is the group of the of the feomorphisms in Cn that preserve the set X. And with this group, we also have an equivalence relation in ON. So two function germs, F and J, are Rx equivalents when exists an element in the group satisfying this condition. And the Bruce Roberts number is finite if and only if F is Rx finitely determinant and the Bruce Roberts number is finite if and only if this germ is a subset of the zero germ. Okay. So now I will talk about the relative Bruce Roberts number. And to calculate the relative Bruce Roberts number, we also use the theta x. Okay. And the relative Bruce Roberts number is equal to this dimension, the dimension as a C vector space of this quotient. And the difference between the relative Bruce Roberts number and the Bruce Roberts number is this ideal here. Okay. So, an example, we consider the same isolated hypersurface singularity. So, theta x is generated by these vector fields. And here, we consider this function germ. Okay. And in this case, the relative Bruce Roberts number is equal to seven. Okay. Well, uh, our, our, our inter interesting remark about this number, it, it, it is, can be finite even when F has no isolated singularity. And we have this example. So we consider the hypersurface determined by this function germ and this function. Okay, so F has no isolated singularity. So the Bruce Roberts number and the Milner number is infinite, but the relative Bruce the relative Bruce Roberts number is finite. Okay. So we, in this presentation, 
we are interesting, interested in, in our relation between these numbers, the Bruce Roberts number, the Miller number, and the relative Bruce Roberts number, okay? And when the isolated hypersurface singularity is weighted homogeneous, we know about the relation between these numbers. So first, I will define when a variety is weighted homogeneous. A variety X is weighted homogeneous when it is the, defined by a map germ phi from CN to CK with the property that, that there exists positive integer number, numbers W1 to WN and A1 to AK satisfying this condition with J from 1 to K. And here, an example. So we consider this ISIS determined by this map germ. This ISIS is, is weighted homogeneous because we have these equalities. Okay. Now, uh, a remark okay, about the weighted homogeneous function germ. So we consider phi a uh, weighted homogeneous function germ satisfying this equality. Okay. And we consider a function germ H in ON plus one given by these, these equalities, okay? So now we calculated the partial derivative of H with respect to T and we, we, we obtain this, these equalities. So now considering T equal to one, we have this relation and the differential of a phi applied in this vector field is equal to a times phi. And this vector is a special vector, okay? And we call this vector of Euler vector field, okay? Well, in the beginning of this, this presentation, I say that it's, it's difficult to calculate theta x, but we but will prove this result. So when X is a weighted homogeneous isis determined by this map germ, okay, theta X is generated by these vectors fields, the Euler vector field, these vector fields with J from one to N and I from one to K, and, the, the, and by the minors of maximum order of this matrix, okay? And with this result, we have that for any function germ f, the ideal df theta x is equal to this sum, okay? Where this ideal jf phi one to phi k is the ideal generated by the minors of maximum order of the Jacobian matrix of f phi one to phi k, okay? So with this equality, Nuno Balesteiros, Orefs Okamoto, and Tomazella prove that if, prove the following result. If X is a weighted homogeneous hypersurface with isolated singularity, and F is a function germ or X finitely determined, then the Bruce Roberts number is equal to the Milner number plus the Milner number of the fiber, okay? Bruce and Roberts prove that X is a weighted homogeneous ISIS and F is a function germ such that the restriction has isolated singularity, then the relative Bruce Roberts number is equal to the Milner number of the fiber. And with these equalities, we have this relation between the Bruce Roberts number, the Milner number, and the relative Bruce Roberts number when X is a weighted homogeneous I8S, okay? And now, okay, considering the previous example, okay, so we consider this, the hypersurface determined by this function germ, the theta x is generated by these vectors, these vectors fields, and the first example, we consider this, this function germ, and we calculated the Bruce Roberts number, okay? So in this case, the relative Bruce Roberts number is equal to one, because the Milner number of f is equal to zero. In the second example, we consider this function germ and we calculated the relative Bruce Roberts number, the relative Bruce Roberts number. And in this, this example, the Bruce Roberts number is equal to 11 
because in this case, the Milner number is equal to four, okay? Um, okay, so we have these equalities when X is an isolate, is a weighted homogeneous hypersurface with isolated singularity. And we have a question, okay? What is the relation when, when X is any isolated hypersurface singularity, not necessarily weighted homogeneous? And we have this example. So we consider X, the, the hypersurface determined by this function germ, okay? And we consider this function, F. So we calculated the Milner number of the hypersurface, the Turina number. These numbers are different. So this hypersurface is not a weighted homogeneous. And the previous equalities is not true in this example. But if you plus this side, the difference between the Milner and Turina number, we have the equality. So in this example, we have these relations, okay? This equality for the Bruce Roberts number and the second equality for the relative Bruce Roberts number, okay? Well, so now I will talk about these relations, okay? And first I will consider the Bruce Roberts number. So our objective is to, to conclude this relation, okay? And it is an interesting relation because with, with this equality, we, we can calculate the Bruce Roberts number without theta x, okay? And this equality wa also was conjectured dur during PAD of Oref Sokamoto. And, okay. And when we consider any isolated hypersurface singularity, we don't know the generators of theta x. So, in this case, we consider the set of trivial vector fields, and we denote this set by theta xt, and theta xt is generated by these vector fields that phi appears in the, coordin in the coordinates, and the vector fields that vanish the differential of a phi, okay? Now I will talk about this, this set. Well, a vector field vanish the differential of a phi if and only if this sum is equal to zero. So this vector field belongs to the CZG of partial derivatives of a phi. Okay, so in this case, these vector fields belong to this module, the module generated by the minors of maximum order of this matrix. Okay. And so we have this characterization for the theta xt. And with this characterization, we have that this equality for any function germ f. Okay, so the f theta xt is equal to this product plus this ideal. And this ideal j f phi is the ideal generated by the minors of maximum order of the Jacobian matrix of f and phi. Okay. Well, with this, this equality, we prove this first relation, okay? This, for, this equality is almost that we wish. They are different because the last term. So now we, we need to prove that this dimension as a C-vector space is equal to Turina number of X. And it was a surprise for us because in this quotient appears the differential of f, but this dimension does not depend of the function, does not depend of the function germ or x finitely determinant that we are considering. Okay? And we prove this equality in two steps. First, uh, first we prove this isomorphism. Okay, so we prove that this quotient is isomorphic the theta x over theta xt. And this isomorphism says to us that this quotient does not depend of the function germ f or x finitely determinant that we are considering. And after we consider a generic linear projection p, and we prove that 
this dimension as a c-vector space is equal to Turina number. Okay, so this way we conclude this relation for the Bruce Roberts number. Okay, I would like to say that Corleorus also proved the same equality of us, and he used a different approach of us, and the works are produced simultaneously. Okay, and now I will talk about the relative Bruce Roberts number, and our objective is prove this relation for the relative Bruce Roberts number. And to prove this relation, we consider this exact sequence. Okay. So, okay. So the, di the dimension as a C vector space of this quotient is equal to the relative Bruce Roberts number. The dimension as a C vector space of this quotient is equal to this sum because the Legroy formula. So to conclude this equality, we need to prove that this dimension as a C vector space is equal to Turina number of X, okay? And we prove the following result. So we consider X, the isolated hypersurface singularity determined by phi, and F, a function germ such that this number is, is finite, okay? So we prove this isomorphism, and this isomorphism says to us that this dimension as a C vector field, eh, oh, sorry. And this isomorphism says to us that the, that the dimension of this quotient as a C vector field is equal to Turina number, because we know that the dimension, this guy is equal to Turina number, okay? Well, but prove this isomorphism is not easy. And actually we prove all these, these relations, these equivalent relations, okay? And we have relations interesting here, okay? Uh, one of them is this, because this quotient is isomorphic, df theta x over df theta xt, and it is not true in general. And we also have a characterization for the Milner algebra of F, okay, using the, the idea of the F theta X, okay. And this way, in this way, we prove these relations for the Bruce Roberts number and the relative Bruce Roberts number. And with the previous equalities, we have this relation between the Bruce Roberts number, the Milner number of F, and the relative Bruce Roberts number, okay? When X is an isolated hypersurface singularity. And again, we have a question. If X is an ISIS, what is the relation? So we have this example. So we consider the ISIS determined by this, this function, this map germ, okay? And we consider this function, f, and we calculated the Milner number of f, the Milner number of the fiber, the Milner number of ices, during the number of ices, the Bruce Roberts number, and the relative one, okay? And we have that the relation for the relative Bruce, for the relative Bruce Roberts number in this example is true, but the relation for the Bruce Roberts number is not true in this example, okay? Well, we, 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 we extend these relations considering X and Isis, okay? And I will talk about these relations considering X and Isis in the, on the next week in the workshop. So if you want to know about more about the, if you want to know about these relations when x0 is an ISIS, I invite you to my, my work, my talk, okay? And I finish, and here, some references, more references, and thank you very much for your attention. It's a pleasure. Okay, thank you, Barbara.
Any question, comment? Thank you, Barbara. Very nice talk. So, can you say something about the geometric meaning of the Bruce Roberts number in, in the case in, in which X is a hypersurface with isolated singularity? And uh, also, can you say something about uh, uh, the difficulty to, to extend this number? to the case in which X is an ISIS. Okay. Our difficult when X is an ISIS. Um, well, when X is an ISIS, we, we, we also don't know the generators of theta X and the difficult beginning in this part. In the beginning, we don't know uh, a, a, a characterization for this element, theta xt. Okay, so mm -hmm. we extend this, this, this characterization, okay, considering x and isis, and with this characterization, we extend the, the work, but uh, so much difficult, uh, the generalization. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, we have to, to work so much. Okay, thank you. So my question is, is there any relation with the homology of the fibers of F? So F is a function on the hypersurface, and I expect the function with isolated singularities in your cases. And then you have the concept of uh, homology of this uh, of these uh, generic fibers. And what I also see in the formulas are things which look like polar numbers. So you see the, the uh, here mu of the F, X mu of X intersected with F inverse zero. This look like numbers you see as a multiplicity of a discriminant. And so the point of view of a function on a, a function on a hypersurface and its topology uh, should be quite interesting to see. Yeah, this number is the Milner number of the fiber, yeah. which is the, uh, of course, the number of spheres in the, you have a bouquet of spheres, yeah. the, this is the Betty number. But yeah, probably it's related to the geometry of the discriminant of the two functions, no, you say? Yeah. Okay, any other question? So one thing that you didn't mention is that this kind of formulas is, they are very strongly related to the fact that uh, the logarithmic characteristic yeah. variety is uh, cohen macaulay So the fact yeah. that you have this kind of formulas is very strongly related to this subject, which is also important in this theory, no? Yeah. Okay, so. Ah. Uh, this is more about Bruce Roberts numbers in general. So as I understand, uh, you're taking a function uh, going from a certain space, and then you consider a hypersurface within that space. Uh, is there any relation between f and x that it's being measured by this value? Um, could you repeat, please? I... So as I understand correctly, f is an analytic function in Owen. And X in a, is a hypersurface in CN or, yes. or RN. Well, so since the Bruce Roberts number is employing both F and X, is there any relation between F and X that's being measured? Mm. 
No, I think I can, I can ask one. <laughs> no, they are not related. You can take any X and any F. The only condition is that the F should be uh, Rx finally determined. Or if you take the relative version, then it should be... Uh, the relative number. The relative number should be finite. Is, yes. And this is equivalent to the fact that they define an ISIS. An no? ISIS. The fiber yes. is an ISIS. Yeah. Yes. So that's the only condition. Okay, so let's thank Barbara again. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the third speaker of this afternoon. Um, uh, he is uh, Eder Leandro Sanchez Quiseno from here, from the ICBC. And he's going to speak about real algebraic links associated to mixed singularities. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizer by uh, to have the opportunity to show my work. And today uh, we'll talk about uh, real algebraic links associated to mixed singularity. This is a joint work with Raimundo Nonato and Benjamin Bot. Well, the motivation of our results is understanding uh, the characterization of real algebraic links. Then we, we use uh, mixed polynomials and mixed singularities. Uh, well, uh, I divide the talk in three parts. The first part, I make introduction, the motivation or the results. And the second part, I give a sufficient condition that I, uh, we call ISND, inner strongly not degeneracy, uh, in order to get uh, isolated singularity. And the last part I will uh, I will discuss about if this condition is also necessary to get isolated singularity. Okay, uh, let's go. Uh, we work with mixed polynomials between uh, from 
C to, to C, what, is, what a mixed polynomial means. It's a complex polynomial, invariable, complex variables U and V, and their conjugates. Uh, this notation, this notation means uh, this new and mu means that are two parts of uh, natural numbers. That is the uh, degree of the complex uh, holomorphic part and the conjugate part. Uh, well, I told uh, that uh, we uh, we are interested in the singular set. Then the definition for mixed polynomial reduces uh, these uh, three equations, right? The singular set or locus, the singular locus of F, denoted by sigma F, is defined as the solution of these three uh, mix also mixed polynomial considered as a set of zero. Uh, this notation means the partial derivative with respect to the variable u, u var, v, and v var. Okay. What important remark is if we have a mixed isolated singularity, uh, it uh, does mean sigma f equals zero, then we can see f as a real polynomial map from R4 to R2. And this has isolated singularity in the classical way, the Jacobian the real Jacobian, okay? Uh, well, what real algebraic link means? Uh, a real algebraic link is a link that satisfies the following two condition is there exists a polynomial map from R2 to R, R4 to R2 with isolated singularity and the origin and the second Condition is that uh, there exists a radius as the such that for any small enough radius, the link that is defined, classical defined as the intersection or the zero set of F with a small sphere is isotopic to L for any small enough radius. And if this uh, kind of polynomial exists, this Call, is called uh, a strong realization of L, okay? Well, what we can talk about real algebraic link, about their characterization. Uh, by Milner, we can see that real algebraic links are, is a fiber link, are the fiber links. That means the complement on the sphere admit a uh, Trivially, locally trivial vibration, okay? Uh, we also have a lot of construction or real algebraic links. The first construction is related to Brenner, that is union of, of the Rattorus knot, the case of plane curve, holomorphic plane curve. And we have uh, other uh, topological construction of real algebra links here for the, the other uh, authors. Um, well, we have a conjecture about the characterization of real algebra links uh, by Benedict and Schotta. They conjecture that all fiber links are uh, real algebraic. Okay. Uh, the two challenge about this conjecture is the first one, is we need to find a polynomial map from R4 to R2 in such a way that for any small radius, the isotopic class of this intersection is the, the link, right? And the second challenge is that we need to guarantee that the, the, this map has isolated singularity, okay? Well, this talk is about the second challenge, uh, to see how to prove that some polynomial, in this case mixed polynomial, has isolated singularity. And this is the reason why we are interested in this condition, the IS 
in the condition, okay? What does this mean? Uh, we use a classical uh, object that is a Newton polyhedra, right? We define the Newton polyhedra, after that we define the, the, this condition in terms of the Newton polyhedra, okay? Or Newton boundary, right? The Newton boundary for mixed polynomials, and it's called it radial Newton boundary, is defined by the uh, convex hull of this set, of the support of F. But what is the support? Is the, for each monomial, you take the sum of the new and mu. That mean you sum the degree of U with the degree of U bar in the first coordinate. The, the second coordinate is the sum of the degree of the V, a variable V and their conjugate. And then you take the, this, con, uh, this Newt Newton polygon. And the phase, the compact boundary of this polygon is calling the Newton boundary, okay? Now, we also need a definition of a function that is a kind of restriction of F on the phase, phases of the Newton boundary. For given a uh, wave vector Q, we associate one phase on the Newton boundary. And which is a phase where this linear map takes a minimal value. Then we define the phase function related to this wave vector. This is the sum, that's the, the degree is belongs to the Newton, the phase function, okay? Before to continue the definition of our condition, uh, we need a partial ordering to en in order to enunciate the results. Well, uh, we define this P as the uh, weight vector associated, uh, sorry, the weight vector associated to the one phases. Uh, well, and we is uh, this set is indexed by this ordering, okay? This you compare the quotient between the first coordinate and the second coordinates, and we denote this order also in the weight vectors given by this. And well, now we have example of that. Uh, this is a mixed polynomial, and. Uh, uh, this is how the Newton polyhedra and the Newton boundary looks. The yellow zone is the Newton polyhedra, and the blue line here is the Newton boundary. Uh, These uh, dot uh, black points are the support of the polynomial. Okay. Well, what I would like to introduce uh, some uh, properties of this map. The first property is called the radially weighted homogeneous, is like the talk before. And it's just to you you have to be careful when the the power here, right? Is the same in U and U bar, okay? But just is this is a kind of same uh, formula or equation. And one observe uh, one remark is that all phase functions have this uh, property, is radial weighted homogeneous. Well, other property that this example has is he is U, sem U semi holomorphic. Does mean that is it does not depend on U bar. This this family it's important for us. Uh, in the last uh, property is that this diagram or F is convenient. That means the new boundary intersect the axis. Okay, keep this property in mind. And well, now we 
we see the condition. If we say that F is inner strongly not degenerate. If for every positive weight vector, the system given by the phase function related to this uh, mixed polynomial that define the singular set, the OF, has no solution. The first condition is in C star two, when the wave vector is between P1 and Pn, and C star two minus U equals zero for P greater to P1. And the last one is analog to the second one. Okay. Uh, one difference between the classical non-degeneracy condition for the inner strong non-degeneracy is the follow. Uh, we can also define the non-degeneracy as Oka works, that uh, is just the, this one is different uh, between, uh, this is the system that defines the singular set of FP and this are different. These are the phase function of the system that define the singular set. This, these two equations are not always e equal, okay? Then these two notions are different. And we also can be define a weak, no degenerate condition that it just include the zero set, okay? In the system, right? This is called no degeneracy. This is a no, this is a strong no degeneracy. And the second one is a no degeneracy condition. Well, what rem important remark is that what condition one of the inner strong no degeneracy is equivalent to the strong no degeneracy only for these weight vectors. For the other ones, is not equivalent in general. And well, we have the sufficient condition. If F is inner strongly not degenerated, then F has an isolated singularity. One important remark is that just a strong not degeneracy does not imply isolated singularity. Then is the reason by the definition of inner strongly not degeneracy, because we want a condition that guarantee isolated singularity, right? We can see in this diagram that by Oka words, that if you add convenience a condition plus a strong no degeneracy, he proved it that we have isolated singularity, right? And we can also prove it that our mixed polynomial satisfies the strong Milner condition. Does mean the argument function that is F uh, divided by the module is a locally trivial vibration, right? And we can also prove by for our class uh, inner strong not degenerate mixed polynomial. And by theorem uh, 2.2, sorry, uh, we have isolated singularity. Then this is a kind of improvement of these two conditions, right? And well, uh, I would like to give you an example. If, if we have a radially weighted homogeneous mixed polynomial, then F has, has an isolated singularity if and only if F is in a strong not degenerated. Then for this class, the mixed polynomial, eh, this condition is necessary and sufficient. But we would like to look for other class of polynomial that's just not only radially weighted homogeneous. Well, the second example of inner strongly non degenerate polynomials is given from family of the products. This is in a preprint with Raimundo. And I don't want to tell you a lot of condition, but I would like to show you an example in order to understand this kind of the difference between this kind of condition. We consider a semi-holomorphic polynomial in variable u. Then the singular set simplified in this way as uh, the solution of these two equations. Well, it's a kind more simple, but it's not. Well, now I consider the mixed polynomial given by this product, but these two are only parameters. 
because I, I would like to show you one a uh, situation when we move the we change the two parameters n and omega. Well, p omega is defined by this way, and we have the follow remark that for all omega complex number, p omega is a strong realization of the torus link T22. And the second polygon uh, polynomial is a strong realization of the torus link T3 minus N, right? Okay, look, uh, let's look on the phase function of, of, P, of F and omega and is given are five, five kind five types of phase functions that are given for this. It's not so hard to find them. Well, for n between one and, and five, we have this five phase function. Well, it's, well, we can prove directly that F and omega is a strong degenerated for these three last phase function. It's not so hard because it's close to the complex case. Then the equation is a kind of simple. And well, uh, we remind that convenience plus strong degeneracy implies I, S, S, and D. Then we can guarantee the condition three because for this uh, PU, we have this one, then we can prove uh, the inner strong node generous. Well, now I have a table about uh, what happened when we mo move the N and omega, and we have five values of omega and five values of N. Well, when you have strong node degeneracy, uh, we can see that this F and omega is convenient. Then this S and D imply isolated singularity. Well, in this uh, S and D, okay? Well, and E, S and D also imply isolated singularity. In this, for one, for three, for four, and for five. But we have a trouble here. And we'd like to explain you what happened with this. And uh, the first thing that I would like to uh, to tell you is that this fake function uh, that is uh, respect uh, to one ver zero vertices, uh, we can see that we have problems when we consider omega 1.1 because the, this phase function has critical points, okay? Then the system given by the phase function, the system, of the singular set of the phase function uh, has solution close to the region, then we the phase the function is not strong enough to generate. Okay, but we can use the equations, the phase functions given by the equation that define the singular set, and we can see that for this thing we have that f satisfies condition two. Look that we consider the first mixed polynomial that define the singular set of semi holomorphic polynomials. And you take the phase function that is not the same that you derive, you make the derivative of the phase function FPU is different for this uh, phase function. And we can, now we can see the problem when n equal to. Okay, we know that the phase function related to P1 is this one, okay? Then you take this phase function, find the derivative with respect to U is this guy. And after that, we have only one root of this uh, holomorphic polynomial is, is given by this one. And after that, you substitute in the second equation, and we get this, this expression that if n equal to, is just zero. It does, doesn't depend on R. Then 
we have this behavior. If you imagine the image, S 3F is equal to FV square minus F V square. This is a real function. We can imagine the image here. We can imagine it, the T here. And we can imagine it, this R here. T is the argument of the val of the, the argument of the variable V. Okay. Then the, the equation say that if you find the parameter uh, param uh, parameterization of the rot of fu the image is equal zero in this doesn't depend on r then the image is just uh this zero zero to p uh, the image is just a plane here okay well then this is the reason why we doesn't have the a astronaut degeneracy condition. And we see that for P1, the astronaut degeneracy condition is equivalent to the inner astronaut degeneracy. Then we doesn't have the, the inner astronaut degeneracy. Well, uh, we can use one uh, argument to say that this this column doesn't have isolated singularity because the link associated to this polynomial is no fiber. Then they always have uh, no isolated singularity. But the question now is for, ah, for the other n values, we have that is different. We can look in the equation, right? Okay. And also by the equivalence between these two conditions, we have condition one. Uh, well, one question is, is this condition necessary a uh, condition to get isolated singularity? Well, the answer is no. In general, we can get an isolated singularity from a inner strong degenerated mixed polynomial. We have uh, one example here. We can consider this a strong realization of the figure A naught. And is given by this. It's not so difficult to see that we have a uh, degenerated phase function, right? And well, but if we assume some hypothesis, then F has an isolated singularity if he only if F is inner strong no degeneracy. But a uh, hypothesis different to the radially weighted homogeneous. Well, the first hypothesis that we consider is F U semi-holomorphic. And I will say that two in three uh, I consider here, but I don't know if uh, we can remove in some way, but now I will consider this to a condition. And the second condition is about the weak not the generacy given by Yoke. We need that F and FU be a not degenerated mixed polynomial for this uh, weight vector, okay? And the third one is just we need to remove these cases. I mean, for parametrizations of the derivative with respect U, uh, this, the image by the second equation has no local extremium, minimum of a, or maximum. You can see that in this case, you have a global, global minimum or maximum anyway, but we can, we want to remove situations like we have something like this, where is, this is zero. Okay, we need to remove this this situation or, or something like this. Okay, we only admit singularities that have something 
on the on the on the graph. Uh, okay. Then we have this equivalence uh, under this above condition: f has isolated singularity if you only if f is inner strongly you not know, degenerate. Well, the main mentions uh, message uh, here is in this class of maps of mixed polynomials, we can understand the singular set, set of F with data of the singular set of FP. Okay? This means that in some way, the singularity of the phase function control the singularity of F. Okay? And thanks very much. Okay, thanks. Nice talk. Any question, comment? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. So now we have a coffee break.
Okay, so let's uh, start. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. So he is Gabriel Esteban Monsalve from the ICMC here and also from the University of Lille. And he's going to speak about uh, Milner set of real polynomials and detector detection of atypical values. Thank you. Thank you all of you for, for staying here. Uh, yes, I'm a PhD student and my advisors are Raimundo Donato and Mihai Tibar. And this work is also supported by uh, FAPESP. So, yes, I'm going to talk about the Milner set of real polynomials in two variables uh, and how we can use this Milner set in order to detect the atypical values in this, uh, in this context. So the table of content is uh, just, I'm going to give an introduction of the problem, just some technical uh, sections, that is the Milner set, I'm going to define the Milner set, that is uh, something that so, uh, it's already told in these courses, and the Milner arcs at infinity, mu cluster, and then I'm going to use this uh, to give a characterization of atypical values. Uh, so yes, uh, as I said, uh, in this section mainly, uh, it's some concepts that are already said by uh, Professor Cesar, Professor Renato, and Professor Nicola also in his uh, course today. And yeah, so it's, uh, let's start F. It's a function from K2 to K, non a non-constant polynomial function where K is uh, the real numbers or the complex. Numbers. So the smallest set BF that is contained in the in K, where F is a same infinitive trivial vibration outside BF, is called the bifurcation set, or also the set of atypical values. <coughs> what we know of this uh, of this set is it's also a classical result. That is that this set is in fact a finite set in K. Uh, the complex. Uh, Proof of this was done by Tom in this paper and by Berdier in, in the second paper in the, in the real context. Mm. Well, one remark about this uh, is that the singular, the, or, well, the set of critical values is contained in the bifurcation set. However, uh, not, it's not true that the critical values are all the bifurcation set. The, all the bifurcation, the atypical values. As we can see, we are going, this example is a really classical example. It's called, it's, an, it's known as a um, Broughton example. And it's a polynomial who has no critical values. And we can see, I'm going to show you here, we have some behavior of, well, some uh, level sets. Uh, the level set of zero, it's this parabola in here that is in black and also the vertical line. Uh, so it has three connected components, but when we take another, any other value different than zero, uh, the, the fibers has only two connected components. So zero, it's a, a bifurcation, it's, it's a, a typical value. So, and well, just remembering it's, uh, it's a regular value too. So from this observation, we can say that the bifurcation set can be decomposed as the set of critical values union some regular values. And if we want to characterize this set, this part of critical values, it's pretty easy, just to, it's already easy to detect, but this is not, uh, the, 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 the question is how to characterize this, this set of regular atypical values. And yeah, that's a, a first uh, problem. Uh, in the complex setting, it's classical. Uh, Suzuki, uh, Ile, in these papers, uh, they just have this result that says that a regular value, lambda, is a typical if and only if the Euler characteristic of the fiber of lambda, uh, it's different from the Euler characteristic of any other, uh, any generic um, fiber. So the only characteristic is detecting uh, the, the typical values in the complex case. Now, in the real case, uh, in this paper, Tibari Saharia, they just they have an example of a polynomial function. Actually, that polynomial was shown by Professor Cesar 
and this uh, example it has like in a the, the, the only characteristic of the fibers around zero is constant. However, the zero is an atypical value. So uh, the only characteristic in the real case is not enough to characterize these atypical values. And in fact, in the same paper, they write a characterization that it depends on two phenomena that may occur at infinity that they call as vanishing and splitting at infinity. So the problem is if we want to detect uh, this, the typical values uh, and following the result of Tibari Saharia, so um, we need to know that depends on vanishing and splitting. The question is how to detect these phenomena at infinity that may produce these atypical values. There are some works already in this direction by Costa y de la Puente. Also, this paper that was, it's from Renato, Joita, and Tibar. Actually, Professor Chesal gave a general picture of what this paper is about. And, uh, well, just for talking uh, pretty quick, what is the idea? They just embed the projective closer of the graph uh, into this space X, uh, of, that is a space of fibers, and this F tilde means the homogenization of the polynomial F. And they just, at some points at infinity, they localize the behavior of the fibers and detect the vanishing and splitting at infinity. I haven't given the definition of this. I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, I'm going to define them later. Well, uh, so let's say the idea of my idea, the idea of this work is using the Milner set to detect these atypical values. So let's define again the Milner set, again in the sense that Professor Nicola already defined this morning. Uh, so we have rho, we denote rho by the square of the Euclidean distance function to the origin. Uh, so the Milner set of F, it's all the points in the, all the points in the plane, such that the fibers of F at that point are not transversal to the fibers of rho or to the, to the circles. Uh, and equivalently, we can define this as, is the singular locus of this polynomial, this, this mapping from R2 to R2, that the first component is the, the polynomial F and the second component is uh, the function rho. Uh, yes, just an, a proposition of, of this is that uh, MF is an unbound, is unbounded set and intersect all the fibers of F. And this is going to be uh, very useful for defining uh, the Milner arcs at infinity. In fact, uh, these Milner arcs at infinity are going to depend on a proposition that I'm going to state right now. And we have that a polynomial F from R2 to R. It's a primitive polynomial. Oh, well, I, I may say what is a primitive polynomial. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just a simple definition. Is polynomial is primitive if F cannot be graded of the composition of a polynomial in one variable composed with the function rho. So that's, if, if it's true, if that's true, it's primitive. So if we have this type of polynomial, then there exists a positive real number R0, such that for every real number bigger than this one, it holds that the Milner set outside the disk uh, with radius R is a disjoint union of uh, of finitely many connected components. And each of these connected components is transversal to the fibers of rho. And the restriction of F to these connected components is either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, uh, provided that this connected component is not contained in the singular, the singular locus of F. So yeah, oh, this is this proposition is it's, it it follows. I mean, theoretically, it follows the existence of this radius. It follows from the semi-algebraic properties of of the Milner set uh, of the Milner set. But we give a proof of how to effectively find this R zero. Uh, yeah, how to find this R zero where we can define 
where, where we, we can have these properties. And with this, we are going to say that a Milner arc at infinity of F, it's just a connected component of the Milner set outside this disk of radius R0. Uh, just an observation, by definition, the Milner set is the points where the fibers of F, F are tangential to the circle centers to the circle centers at the origin. So we have two types of situations that it's like here we have in red, we have the a connected component of a fiber. And this connected component of the fiber is locally uh, inside the sphere, as we can see here, or locally outside the sphere. So in this situation, when it's locally inside, we are going to say that it's a row maximum. And when it's uh, locally outside, we'll say that it's a row minimum. That's the type of tangency. But now we want something better. We have a better thing that for any Milner arc, uh, yeah, any Milner arc at infinity of F has a well row type of tangency. It means that if I have a, the same Milner arc and I know that there's a connected component that intersects like in, for example, like a row minimum, all the fibers that inter intersect the same uh, connected component are going to have the same row type of tangency, row minimum or row maximum. Yeah. So with this, we can go to, to what is a mu cluster. So uh, yeah, first let me just fix a parametrization of the Milner, of a, any Milner arc, such that, well, from R0 to infinity, uh, such that the limit of t when goes to infinity, well, and then the limit of the norm of gamma t, uh, gamma t when t goes to infinity is going to be infinity. And for that, we define what is an increasing Milner arc at infinity of s f associated to lambda. Lambda is a real number or a infinity or plus infinity or minus infinity. What it means is like, the, these two conditions, the first condition says that when I compose f with gamma, uh, gamma t uh, is an increasing function. And we know that it happens because of the proposition that I state before defining the Milner arcs. So it's increasing. That's going to be the increasing condition. And the limit of t when goes to infinity of the same composition goes to this value lambda. So that's what it means being associated to lambda. And for simplifying this, we are going to use this symbol when f, it's just some uh, arrow going up and associated to the value lambda. We have the same definition for decreasing, just in the first condition, just instead of increasing, we are going to we say that it's decreasing. And of course, it's, I mean, uh, it's completely resonating to the increasing case, so I'm just going to keep in the increasing case. So yes, um, up to now, what we have is that we have the Milner set, and we know that outside some have the Milner set, and outside some uh, some disk big enough, we have that finitely many connected components like this, and. What we are going to do in here is we are going to take all of them, we are going to order them as a counterclockwise sense. And then uh, we are going to take from all of them some sequence. For example, I'm going to take uh, this, let's see this sequence of consecutive, consecutive Milner arcs. And we are going to say that they belong to a mu cluster, they a mu cluster, if the three of them satisfies uh, the condition, the same condition of being increasing and being associated to the same value lambda, and that in some, in, and that, that sequence is uh, maximal, in the sense that if I take the, the consecutive Milner arc of gamma E, it's not going to satisfy this condition, and the same thing if I take the, the, the previous uh, Milner arc uh, of gamma key, I, I, it won't satisfy this condition of being increasing and being associated to the value lambda. So uh, yeah, this is this looks so technical, but in fact, it, we have this theorem that it's really related with the fibers 
Uh, I'll let this theorem in here, but I'm just going to give some uh, explanations in here. Let's suppose that this is the mu cluster, and we know that there should be some fiber intersecting in some way. Let's see in here. So if it intersects this one of the Milner arcs in the same mu cluster, so it should intersect all of the Milner arcs in the in the in the same mu cluster. So in some sense, what we have is that some correspondence between all the mu clusters, cum or until cn, associated to the same value lambda, we can associate to all, each of them a connected component of the function uh, that intersect all of them. Of course, for, for connected components of fibers of a t close enough to to the value lambda where the mu cluster is associated. And yes, but so we have just a function. This, this means that we have a function what corresponds with that. But this theorem says that if we restrict our function, fr, it means if we restrict f outside a big enough cir uh, circle, uh, this correspondence or this function, in fact, is an injective function. And the Good thing of this is that we are going to describe the behavior of these connected components uh, in, terms of, in terms of a very simple property of each of the Milner arcs, that it's the following uh, condition. It's really simple, in fact. If we have a, a mu cluster associated to lambda, we say that C is odd um, if it has an odd number of mu, mu Milner arcs at infinity. And the same thing for even. Uh, the, the mu cluster is even if it has a even number of Milner arcs at infinity. Yes, so, uh, yeah, like that. Uh, so we are, I'm just about telling about the characterization of these atypical values. And it's, but before that, let's just give some definition. Uh, it's a little technical, but I put some, uh, some, a picture in here that is going to help, and also this was introduced by Professor Cesar too. So, what what is vanishing? I'm intending to define what is the vanishing at infinity at some value lambda. So, what it is is like if I take for some close enough t that is close enough to lambda, I'm going to take the fiber that is the the green fiber that we can see here, and this green fiber is going to be outside some some circle. Then I'm just going to get up, approximate to lambda, and this is going and that fiber is going to be outside a bigger circle, and just keep going like that. So in some senses, the circles are just sending the, all the fibers to infinity, and at the point where t goes to lambda, the fiber just vanished, as the name say. We have no, or well, not the fiber, in fact the connected component is just vanishing. So it's called vanishing at infinity. And if we don't have this, this, uh, this property, I mean, we fix the lambda and no one of the connected components of the fibers close enough are vanishing. So we just denote it like NV lambda, like no vanishing at lambda. Now for a splitting, uh, we have in here, well, I'm going to use also some picture for this. This dashed curve in here is the Milner arc of this curve. In fact, it's the example of Broton that I said before. But uh, in this dash curve, in, we have this dash pair and this green, this green fiber. All these fibers are intersecting this, are intersecting this, uh, this branch. I would say at infinity of of the of the Milner arc. That is what is exactly this condition one. And also that the limit of the or the limit of the of the connected component, it's going to be not connected. We can see as we saw in the first uh, first slides, this component uh, is as approaching to the fiber of zero. And it's the fiber of zero is this hyperbola, so this connected component in here, and also the vertical line. So one connected component is just splitting in two connected components in this case. 
So that's what is said. Uh, is, to, is what, that's what means uh, splitting at infinity. And of course, the same as in the vanishing, we have the notion of ns when for that lambda there's no any components uh, that are uh, splitting. Yes. So this is the thing. Uh, this is the key part of the theorem of the characterization. We have that uh, lambda, a regular value, it uh, has either vanishing or splitting at infinity if and only if there exists an odd mu cluster to lambda. And it's, I'm going to just a geometrical idea of what's happening. We have these Milner arcs. Let's say this is a mu cluster, an odd mu cluster. So we have two, I mean, there are two options for the tangents in here. Let's say that it's like this. So the fiber has to do like this. And all the fibers, when I approach, oops, when I approach to infinity, when I approach T, goes to, this is the fiber of a connected component of the fiber of T. When I approach to the value lambda, it just keep going like this. And let's just change. At the end, in the affine plane, we are going to see two connected components since this part is approaching to this fiber and this other one to this other fiber. So in this case, so let's just remark that uh, in this, we start with a row maximum. And since it's odd, it finished with a row maximum too. So it, it produced this splitting, uh, splitting, um, Phenomena and we have the same for the for the vanishing. So have another, let's say, a not new cluster. And then uh, if we start with the other type of tangency, like this, it should be this way. All the fibers, this is the fiber F T, the connected component of the fiber of T. And when T goes to lambda. Just the fibers are doing this. And when we get in lambda, this is going to be to disappear. So that's what is uh, the vanishing at, at the splitting. That's why this oddness of the mu cluster is producing um, this either vanishing or splitting. Uh, yes, so with this, this is the fundamental part. And we have the theorem in here that it's if f from r to, to r is not is a primitive polynomial function then a regular value lambda of r is an atypical value of f r uh, if and only if uh, there exists a not new cluster associated to lambda and it's pretty easy with this proposition since if we using this result from joita and tibar that it says that lambda regular value of f uh, we have that non-vanishing at lambda and not vanishing and split, but not splitting at lambda. If and only if uh, lambda is a is a typical value. So if we say in here that we have that lambda is an atypical value by the proposition. We have that there exists a vanishing or a splitting, and if there exists a vanishing of splitting with the proposition of Joita and Tibar, we have that lambda is an atypical value. So that's basically the idea of, of this of this characterization. Uh, let me just see what is it. Oh yeah. So also what happens maybe just to, I think have something just to what happens with the even clusters, for example. What is going to happen is uh, for example, uh, and it's exactly what is happening in there's this example. In this example, it has a cluster associated to the an even cluster associated to the value zero. And in fact, like zero is not an atypical value because what is happening is that the fibers are having this behavior in here. So it keeps going like this when approximates to zero. But at the end, at the value zero, it's just going to be one line like this. So there's no vanishing or splitting and the value it's, it's, uh, it's typical, 
I mean, it's, it doesn't belong to the bifurcation set. Uh, so yes, uh, that's all. And well, just the last comment. Um, and we are we did this work in order to uh, study the index at infinity of the gradient uh, of a polynomial function. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Questions, comments. So this is um, in the in the in the two-dimensional case. Is there any you know obviously it would be more complicated. Is there any hope to have some sort of characterization in terms of some analog of mu clusters in higher dimensional cases? Ah, it's really difficult because it depends on the Milner set that would define would have like a good dimensional and in general it doesn't happen. And it's more difficult to to control that that situation in in you know bigger dimensions. There are some generalizations, but it depends that the fibers of the of the polynomial are one dimensional. There are some approaches to 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 do this, yeah, but that condition is really really important. But... Anything else? Okay, so let's thank Gabriel again. We have a couple of minutes to change. Okay, so let's go for the next junior speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Helen Santana from the ICMC. Uh, she's going to speak about the local topology of function germs with a one-dimensional critical set. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here to talk about my work and to see everybody again after so many, so much time, right? Uh, so I thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to be here. So I will talk about the local topology of function germs with a one-dimensional critical set. And the approach I'm going to give is using stratifications. So stratifications will 
um, play an important role in this approach. So let me just give you some motivation. So during our classes uh, last week and this week, we saw the Muller number appearing to to allow us to understand the topology of this function of this set. So we have a function defined in, in CN with isolated singularity at the, at the origin. And using the Milner number, we can understand the topology of this intersection, right? So delta is a small value next to the origin. And we, we look at this intersection. All right, so we know that um, the homotopy type of this intersection is a bouquet of spheres. And the number of spheres appearing in that uh, product, that wedge product, is what is called the Milner number of the function f. And using the Milner number, we can compute the Euler characteristic of this uh, set, which is called the Milner fiber, right? Uh, actually, we do know how to write this formula. So the Euler characteristic of the Milner fiber is given like this. And in Barbara's talk, we even saw an algebraic way to compute the Milner number. So being a, a set complete, complete tool to study the topology of a function with isolated singularity at the origin, it's not uh, strange to look for generalizations for the Milner number. But um, what, I'm, what I wanted to do here is to present a setting where we can compute this Euler characteristic, but in the case where F is defined on a singular space and F has non-isolated singularity at the origin, all right? For that, we, if you want to understand the singularities of a function f, of such function f, maybe I could put g here, we need to take into consideration the topology of our space x. And a strategy to do that is using stratifications. A stratification is when we decompose our space into submanifolds. Sub and this is the first uh, definition I wanted to discuss with you. So we take it here, we take here X to be a complex analytic space. So last week in Bruno's class, we saw that a complex analytic space locally can be seen as the zeros of a finite number of functions in your N, right? So this is the this is the way we are looking at this space X. So a complex analytic stratification is a decomposition of X into complex analytic submanifolds such that the closure of each one of that submanifolds is still analytic and complex. And this closure can also be uh, right by, um, as a union of those strata, as a union of that submanifolds. A useful stratification is the Whitney stratification because Sometimes we need a type of regularity between the strata of that stratifications. So for a Whitney stratification, this is a quite long definition, but I will write with you to follow the, <laughs> the explanation. So we are going to start with a complex analytic stratification of our space and say that, uh, and the following conditions should be satisfied. So if we take, a sequence of points in V alpha. In here, we, we are taking a pair of strata of the complex analytic stratification, and V beta is contained in the closure of V alpha. And we take a sequence of points in V alpha, a se sequence of points in V beta, both of them converging to a point Y in V beta. So this sequence of points Xi de defines a sequence of tangent spaces to V alpha. And if we take these two points, Xi and Yi, we have 
defined also a line. And we can tell, we can suppose that the limit of this tangent spaces is T and the limit of this sequence, this, sec this line, sorry, is L. So we take the tangent space to V beta our, in our limit point and the conditions that Whitney defined is that this tangent space should be contained in this limit, this space limit, and also the line L should be contained in that limit T. So this is what is called a Whitney stratification. Um, this is not quite the stratification I want because if we want to uh, study uh, the topology of a function defined on a complex analytic space, we should also need a regularity between the fibers of F and the strata of our stratifications. So this is what Tom, Tom stratifications gives us. Um, so to define a Tom stratification, we start with a Whitney stratification and we take a pair of strata, a sequence of points in V alpha converging to a point P in V beta. And we look at the tangent space. Here I have the, the way we are denoting the tangent space on the fibers of F. It's like, like this one, like over here. And then the sequence of points PI in V alpha defines a sequence of tangent spaces to the fiber of F restricted to that strata containing our sequence, our, our sequence of points. And this sequence of spaces should converge to a T. And what we need is that the tangent space on the fiber, when you look at the limit point, so F is restricted to the strata that contains that point, should be contained in this space limit. So this is what is a uh, Tom stratification. Okay. The Tom stratifications still are not the one <laughs> that I wanted. What I want is this one, uh, the good stratification that was defined by Massey. So to define a Tom stratification, we do need a function and a complex analytic space. And for the good stratification, we also need this, this element, this function defined on a, on a singular space. So what Massey tells us is that uh, a good stratification of a space relative to F is a stratification that is adapted to the zeros of F, here VF is the zeros of the function F. Being adapted means that VF is the union, is a union of strata of that stratification. If we take the collection of the strata, of the, a collection of strata of that stratification out of the set of zeros of F, then this collection is a Whitney stratification for the R space out of the zeros of F. And if we take a pair of strata, one, the first one out of the zeros of F, and the second one, in the zeros of F, then this type of strata should satisfy, should satisfy the AF Tom condition. The AF Tom condition is this condition I wrote in here. So we took these sequences and these limits, uh, this condition on the tangent spaces should be satisfied. So using this stratification in that work, hypercomology of Milner fibers, Massey studied the hypercomology of this type of set. So when we have a function like this one, like, like, like T, sorry, <laughs> uh, we can consider the inverse image of a regular value. But since T is, is defined on X, we should also intercept this fiber with a stratum, with a stratum of a, um, appropriate stratification. So this appropriate stratification for Massey was this good stratification. And for two other mathematicians, uh, this good stratification was also appropriated. 
this to mathematicians is Professor Nicola Dutertri and Nivaldo Grulia. They were my advisors during my PhD, and they could com somehow compute this Euler characteristic in the case that we had a good stratification of X relative to G, which is this definition I just showed you. They actually defined in 2014 uh, a number associated to this function with non-isolated singularities and defined on a singular variety. This is the Brazilian number. I'm not going to into the details or the definition. I will follow Barbara and ask you to, uh, invite you to come to my uh, lecture next week. But this number, the essence of this number is somehow to compute this Euler characteristic. So I will show you how did I contribute to this approach of study of uh, the non-isolated singularities of functions. But I just wanted to, to make it clear that if I wanted to follow uh, Nivaldo and Nicola and Massey, I should always, and, and if I have a function with, no, with a one-dimensional critical set defined on a singular variety, I should always have a good stratification of the variety with respect to my function. So this type of definition was kind of the first step of my work. Before I show you how I uh, construct a such stratification, I will show you this example given by Massey. In the case that we have a function with a stratified isolated critical point at the origin. And here we do have an an important uh, term, which is this stratified critical point. Uh, the first thing I told you was that I was looking at the critical set of a function in the stratified sense. So we always will consider, consider the critical space of a function with respect to a fixed stratification. So this is the union of the critical sets of our function restricted to each one of those, those strata of our fixed stratification. So what Massey means here, saying that F has a, a stratified isolated critical point is that this set here, this union, is only the origin. And in that case, this collection where we look at uh, witness stratification of our space, which always exists. I didn't told you, but it always exists. And we take the, the strata out of the zeros of F, the strata intercepted by the zeros of F and the origin itself, then this collection is a good stratification of X relative to F. And uh, it, it has a, a special name, which is good stratification induced by F, right? So now let's see what we have in the non-isolated critical case. So we took a complex analytic space X and we do have a witness stratification I denoted by W here. And G will be a germ of function with a one dimensional critical set. This um, critical set I'm looking in the stratified sense and following my, my notation in the slide, here I'm looking at the witness stratification that we took. So I will just show, just write, following the, the, the notation I put in the slide. So, okay, with this witness stratification, if we take a linear form L, we can construct, following the, the example of Massey, we can construct a stratification induced by this linear form. But it's not any linear form, it's a generic one. And uh, by generic, I mean uh, the following. So if we have, no, let me just say this. Brasile Lenciad proved that there is a dense set in the space of complex linear forms that satisfies these two uh, conditions. So by she's by X, <laughs> by X reg, I mean the regular points of X. And if you take a sequence of regular points of X, let me just 
right? Maybe it's easier to follow the because it's too much information. But so if we take a sequence of points in the regular part of X, then we have a sequence of tangent spaces, and this converges to some space T. And then our genetic forms would satisfy the following. So if we take the inverse mate of zero by L, this is a hyperplane, and this hyperplane is transversal to this limit over here. And the same uh, works when we look at the strata of that stratification. If we take a sequence of points in each one of those strata, converging to a point in the closure of that strata, the same um, condition should be verified. So if so what Bracelet Lay Sadi proved is that these two conditions, there exists a very large um, set in the complex linear form space that satisfies these two conditions. So what we are looking at is what we are using here is one of those genetic linear forms. All right, so I took that function. Let me just uh, go back to this slide where we are setting our, uh, our space of study. So this function G has a one dimensional critical set and we are taking this, um, this good stratification induced by a generic linear form. So what I proved was that if we take this collection, so here I look at VI, which are strata of that uh, good stratification induced by the by generic linear form. So if you look at VI out of the zeros of G, VI intercepted by the zeros of G, but out of the critical set of G, and VI intercepted by the critical set of G, then this is a good stratification of X relative to G. So with uh, using this stratification, I got somehow some control on this strata that we are going to use. And then we could compute kind of easily, <laughs> not easily, but we could have some more control uh, to compute this Euler characteristic. And um, not only I could compute this Euler characteristic, I could also use this collection to build a good stratification of the, this slice of X. So here we have our hyperplane, that one that was defined by our genetic linear form. So we can cut our space and still have a good stratification induced, uh, good stratification of this space relative to G. And using this stratification, the second one, we could compute this other characteristic. In here, I didn't put the strata of our stratification, but uh, I just wanted to, I want you to understand that here we are looking at each one of those strata. So we look at this, this intersection, here we have this fiber of G and L intercepted, and the, the topology of this intersection is the same, the same one of the same type that we see over here, all right? So, Presenting this work uh, in Vitoria, I, I talked to a colleague and a friend, Thais Dalbelo, and she asked me if we could apply this type of results to the Toric case. Because in the Toric case, we do have more control on the strat of the witness stratification, and I tell you why. If we to define a Toric variety, I'm not giving you all the details, but to define a Toric variety, we need a group action, which is the torus action. And the orbits of that action are actually Whitney strata. So they are strata of a Whitney stratification. So it got control on VI, the, the beginning of our story, right? So uh, what Thais taught me is that if we have a non-degenerated function, and this is the non-degenerated that Gaffney told us on Monday, uh, if we have this situation, this collection is not a witness stratification in general, all right? But it is 
a good stratification. And this is what we proved, that that is a good stratification in the case that F has a one-dimensional critical set. But it's all right for us. It's the beginning, right? And we this is what we use to compute this type of Euler characteristic. And uh, using all the, the things that I know, <laughs> we could uh, get uh, this type of results. So uh, that was a part of this work that I mentioned here from uh, Professor Davello, Grulia, Hartmann, and myself. And that's it. Thank you. Yes. Any questions? So I think I have two questions. The first question is that you mentioned in the beginning you work with stratifications by analytic subspaces. Yes. Is that always possible? Because usually a witness stratification is by smooth, sub like smooth manifolds. Yeah. Yeah. We, we look at the witness certification in the regular part of our variety, mm -hmm. right? And the other part of the variety doesn't need to satisfy the, the witness conditions. We only need to be Tom, uh, to satisfy the Tom conditions and that it's okay. But the stra so it's always possible if you start with an analytic space yes. to get the witness certification by where the strata are analytic as well. Yes. Okay. And then the second question is what you mentioned at the end about historic varieties. The stratification that you get by this group action, by the orbits, is also a very special one because the regular, like the neighborhoods of the strata, they have like a trivial vibration or like a trivializable link vibration. Yes. Do you have some control about these link vibrations of this induced good vibration that you produced? Mm, no, I have never uh, studied that specifically. But it's a nice question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe you could think about that. Yeah, I'd sure. be interested. Thanks. Very nice talk. Thank you, Timo. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So thank you, Helen, again. Okay.
Okay, so let's go for the last junior speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Giovanni Villanueva from the Federal University of Guayas. And he's going to speak about normal forms of constrained differential systems. Well, thank you so much for the invitation for this lecture. I will talk about uh, differential systems, but relation with uh, singularity theory. So, uh, firstly, I will uh, give an historical introduction about uh, the, the history of this problem. Next, uh, an introduction to, um, to some singularity theory that I use for a specific problem, and that problem is to find a normal forms a, for a constrained differential systems. A, well, during this lecture, I will give a, some physical example and some applications that, and I hope a, this will be fine for you, for all of you. So, a, well, for defining the, the the object that we want to study here, uh, the, this is the well, the principal object. Uh, this is a constrained differential equation. Uh, we have in we have in this part a, a matrix of functions, uh, a vector file x and. Um, well, in the in the points where this matrix, uh, the points uh, where well where this matrix of functions uh, gets uh, singular, then we will have an special cases that we will try to to understand. Uh, well, and this theory of dynamical system it has been. Uh, a lot of develop, development and improve since the decade of the 50s, um, also with the singularity theory. So, uh, well, for introducing this theory, we uh, we have to start with Newton and Leibniz defining the the calculus in the in the 17th century. Next, we find uh, Poincaré, uh, which was the, the father of, of the qualitative, qualita qualitative um, theory of differential systems. And this, this book was very important. Uh, Memoirs sur le, sur le corps, sur le corps defini par un equation differential. Bien? Next to next to Poincaré was another very important mathematician, the uh, mathematicians like Lyapunov Lepone and Andronov uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Lyapunov was the uh, the creator of uh, well the the first person who think about uh, who talk about a problem that. We will. I will present at the at the end of the lecture. Well, next, uh, with me in 1955, with his book uh, "Mappings of the Plane to the Plane," uh, introducing the the singularity theory. Uh, well, after that, uh, Tom and Simon in the 60s, uh, uh, they got a lot of. Uh, Apportations and development to, to the theory of singularity and especially in theory of catastrophes. Uh, next, well, Peixoto, who was was a very important mat a Brazilian mathematician who um, gives a, a, a he gave a characterization of the structural stability of um, differential systems in in the plane it was very important next takens also 
uh, about the the and that theory of catastrophes also that was very important and for this for the problem of constraining the differential system was Shua and Sitomirsky. This is in fact uh, a problem which uh, appears on uh, on an application to theory of circuits in fact and um, also Sotomayor. Uh, um, he did a lot of apportations to to the study of constrained differential systems. So, uh, well, for introducing the, the singularity theory, uh, we have here a, a figure which appeared in a in in a book of Farner, which, in fact, I, I really like this picture because. Uh, here in this manifold, well, with, with the projection and the function, we, we can find two, two faults in this part and a cusp in here. And this is an application to psychology. We, we have in this case three, three parameters. Uh, well, uh, this is a technical, technical, uh, Technical apportations, uh, enthusiasms, and uh, well, this this a is um, um, actuation, or, yeah, something like that. Like the well, the yeah, the actuation in the in the scientific community in the scientific community. And according to these parameters, one person can be, or one scientific can be a crazy person or a genius. Well, um, to start, we, I want to, to give a definition uh, about contact. This, this is a, a definition which is a definition which is equivalent to the definition which was given by the professor Alexandre and professor Edson. And in this case, the contact uh, will be defined uh, in, a, in a more generic case, in this case for Riemannian manifolds, like this, using the, the Riemannian metric of uh, the Riemannian manifolds. But in the case of the Professor Alexandre, it's equivalent, the definition. But, but in this case, um, well, we, got, we have a, a contact of order k, well, and this definition, um, in fact, uh, we will uh, allow us to define this, this very useful object, that is the jet space. Well, in fact, the jet space is, uh, well, the K jet space, we will define as the, um, as the equivalent classes uh, under the, the relation of equivalence, which, uh, which give us the, the contact of the contact of the contact of order k. Well, that, that is the way that it is defined the the jet space usually. Well, uh, but in in the real case, um, this definition uh, is equivalent to use uh, to see the the um, uh, Taylor series of a function. So, in this case, we can define the k jet in a point, oh, sorry, x, like f g a plus g is a plus x, the derivative of a plus a x 2 over 2 factorial, right? 
the second der derivative in A plus plus x power k over k factorial f uh, k derivative in A of the function f. And in this case, um, for real spaces, we can get a, a, a very explicit the de definition of a of a of a jet uh, as the um, um, the Taylor polynomial of the function until the the k term. Well, so uh, we have to use now other definition. This is a well a vector bundle with this uh, a four tuple in this case using uh, two differential manifolds and we have a fever f and um, well this is this is uh, very similar to to the Milner vibration. I I don't know if a Milner vibration is or a Milner bundle, a Milner bundle is equal is is a is a an, ex, an example or a type or a type of a vector bundle, but in this case uh, we are we are we use this object in this case well for for the edge point of um, of the manifold M. It is like we have a, a vector space. Well, and there are vibration, vibrations over each point of the of the manifold. But uh, well, also we have the the concept of the concept of section of section of a of a vector bundle, and this section is like that. Um, a vector space that we put over that point. Well, and in this in 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 this case for differential systems, we use um, as the general vector bundle. Um, well, the the varieties in this case, the the manifolds will be um, these. Uh, Jet space with infinity dimension, which we can define that jet space as the inverse limit is the sorry the inverse limit of the chain of a uh, KJ spaces. Well, KJ spaces is the set of um, the whole KJ that we can define over the function. So we have the following chain, uh, JK2, like uh, canonical projections, JK minus sum to J2 to J1 to J0. Well, and in this case, uh, J infinity is the inverse limit of, of this chain. Well, but um, we will use specifically the sections of that tangent bundle, of that vector bundle, sorry. And well, this will be, will, this will have more sense after more, more definitions. Well, again, um, we will use uh, distributions. Well, the, the, the definition was, was given already for, for our colleagues. 
Uh, but specifically, we will use uh, stratifications, which, which is a kind of distribution over a, um, a manifold. Uh, well, this distribution is simply uh, a function with which to to each point uh, uh, we associate uh, um, a subspace of the of the tangent of the tangent tangent space, well, and so um, well in this case um, we 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 are to change our manifold. Uh, for um, well, for uh, a study another kind of manifold, we will use um, w. We will use um, one differential forms in this, in this case. We will consider the set of the whole uh, differential one differential forms. Which is over the the manifold, where and over over this over this set, we we define the the PFAF or PFAFian equation. Both, both names are equivalent. As well, using this notation. In this case, will be oh, sorry. In this name and these P of N equations uh, have the property that they are invariant under uh, the action of diffeomorphism. Well, but uh, uh, for making more easier the the cones, we can we can use this. Of an equation as, as a one differential form. Well, and also with, um, with this differential form, we, um, we have um, a famous theorema. We have the, the Frobenius theorema, which say that. Um, um, well, say that uh, uh, for for a generic, uh, well, we will have that um, a Pifafian equation will be uh, completely integrable if the if the Pifafian equation satisfies the the following the following condition. We have that. This which the W to K different from zero. Well, and this this condition uh, we will define also um, some stratifications over over the variety over the um, over the manifold, and that's that's the that's the way that we will follow after that. Well, uh, this is this is a way to to define the the jet space over the the set of uh, one forms. So uh, we will use uh, again the the ideal of germs of functions in in the. We, we will suppose that zero is a, a critical point from from the next. Well, um, uh, well, we consider also an an stratification. Well, and um, well, in this in this way we define this this ideal and also. It's a uh, Kate Powers. Well, and then uh, in that way, we can define the, the jet of a P of N equation as the quotient of 
the the set of uh, PFAFN equations uh, with that ideal. Well, and um, well, we as we are in in a real space, we can find an explicit uh, form for that uh, for that jets. For example, in this case, this jet is. Uh, this is the jet of a function, in this case, using the partial derivatives, derivatives. Well, and also we will have the, the jet of a one form. Uh, well, that is, uh, if, we, if we have a one form here, then its jet is the jet of uh, ES coefficient function of the one for well well this is this is one of the 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 main definitions um, in this in this case we define an orbit of a or well of a gm in this case of um, um, well, the orbit of a, of a differential of a one form, which um, will be um, um, will be defined with the group action of the of the set of diffeomorphism under the one form, and this action is using the pullback. Well. As, as in the um, in Professor Gaffney lecture. So, in this case, only for remembering, uh, if we have a diffeomorphism, pull back uh, one form in X of W. This W is, is a tangent vector. So this is the four applied on F of X times the, the derivative of F of X for the tangent vector. Well, this is the way to define the, the pullback in this case. And, well, for all x in Rn. And uh, this element in the tangent space. Well, well, we are working on, on the whole space Rn. Well, uh, well, there, uh, and these these orbits also define for us um, the equivalence of of two germs. Well, two, we have the two germs an equivalent if uh, there exists a diffeomorphism such that we get this relation. Well, <laughs> well, and uh, well, this is how uh, uh, we will say that uh, we will have a singularity class if um, um, if we get the um, if, if the the set uh, that we have we have to say if that is a singularity class is closed under uh, the action of the the set of this diffeomorphism. Well, another and another way to to define a singularity class is like this, using the the jets. Well. And we will say that uh, a property is generic if, uh, 
that property is valid for a residual residual set. Well, uh, well, next uh, we'll use the the definition of transversality. In this case, well, transversality uh, under two manifolds. Uh, we will say that a function over two manifolds is transversal. Uh, it's transversal to a, a distribution if we get uh, this, this relation, if the, the image uh, of the, um, uh, well, see, yeah, the image of the tangent space of the, of the uh, manifold M plus other uh, tangent space, but in the, in the other manifold, is equal to the uh, to the n manifold. So, well, we can see this uh, that in this image, in this picture, uh, we have a one-dimensional manifold, and its image is a curve over this manifold. And uh, well, the the image of its tangent its tangent space is. Um, is a well a line could be a line in space, but we we got we find we get uh, a vector, a vector which uh, give us that line, and the next other curve is C, which is which is over the manifold n. and we can see that the two tangent band the two tangent Vectors generate uh, can generate the whole plane, which define the tangent vector of n. Well, that is uh, an example of transversality. Um, well, we have uh, this theorem, uh, which is that is so useful for. Um, uh, well, for getting some informations, uh, the the things that happens uh, with the money with the with the sun manifolds according to the collimations. Well, for example, uh, in this uh, in this case, if the collimation of S the of the uh, stratification the well um, one strata of the stratification is more is bigger than than the dimension of the of the manifold then we can say that uh, mm, well in that mm, well, the co-dimension of the strata is bigger than the dimension of the manifold. So we can say that the points that satisfy the, the condition over the manifold is empty. Well, if the co-dimension of S is equal to M, um, the condition that defines um, the 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 singularity class um, is only satisfied by um, isolated points. And if the codimension of S is less than the dimension of the, of the manifold, then the, um, well, the, the condition which satisfies the singularity class is generic. Well, and uh, well, the proof of this theorem uh, is based on the, is a result of the um, of the SAR theorem, and with that theorem we can get the transversality theorem. In fact, uh, well, this is the strong. This is a version of the strong Tom singularity theorem, which we say that. Uh, uh, 
Well, if if we have uh, um, um, well, if we have an um, countable in a countable certification in the in the set of k jets, then uh, this set define it as um, well. We can say this. It is better in, in the in the one form set. If we have an element of uh, the singularity class such that it, uh, its germ, its k germ, is transverse to the singularity class, so this set is uh, well will will be an open and then set over the the section of the of the of the vector bundle that we are consider so will be open and set in the in the cage space and using that is that we can well we can um, we can develop a theory for uh, classifying uh, constrained differential systems. So, um, in this case, we have an example of, of a constrained differential system with this matrix, but we can say that when X and Y are in the unitary circle, the determinant of this matrix is zero, yeah? And this is, this is a constant vector file and the thing that we get is that in this in this in this circle uh, the differential equations is not well defined but um, the thing that we want to do is uh, to classify the set of generic uh, systems of this form well so we have these definitions about more more generic definitions about that kind of differential systems, and we have that these constrained constrained systems are in fact a Banach space using the fact that. Um, the, determ the determinant of the product of two matrices is equal to the determinant of A multiplied by the determinant of B. Well, using that, we can see that uh, this, this set of differential system is closed under the weak topology the topology induced by by the cards and there is a theorem in which appear in, in the in the Hirsch book that said that um, we say that um, it is a bare space and a Banach space in the Whitney topology in the strong topology uh, well um, in fact, this set, this this set where we have the 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 generation of the matrix is defined as the impasse the impasse set. And uh, well, we we will use uh, this theory over the the one differential form forms that we created. To um, uh, well, to analyze that kind of differential systems, we can transform uh, the or this differential system uh, in a for uh, to get uh, something similar to differential form. Uh, using this, we can uh, multiply this system. By by a vector of differential form, 
So in the in the left part, we get again a vector of differential form, and in the right side, we get a vector of function of functions. Then we can um, we can we can get using this transformation a, 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 a version of the transversality theorem. In this case, for constrained differential systems, we will have that if uh, defining uh, singularity classes over the set of the of, of constrained differential systems, we have that the codimension, if the codimension is um, bigger than the dimension of the variety, then um, the set. Uh, the set which defines um, that singularity class in the manifold is empty in this case. And if the codimension of S is equal to N, then in the manifold it consists of uh, only isolated points. Well, so, uh, well, we. We have to, uh, this is a typical thing in dynamical systems. We have to preserve the, the things, that, the topological, the canonical regions that we have. So uh, we have to preserve, for example, uh, the orbits. And we have to preserve uh, that in pass curve, in, in curve that we define back in, in the back slide. So, uh, well, for finish, I, I only want to to present one, to present one result making in five minutes. Uh, if we have um, two forms, uh, two one differential forms that are generic in a two manifold, and we define that that set, that singularity class in this way. Then we have that, well, this, this is a way to say that this alpha is in the impasse set, the impasse, yeah, the impasse set. Then uh, we have that this set uh, has dimension one and well, dimension one in the tangent space of, of M in, in that point. And also uh, that is that impasse set is a smooth curve. So for doing that, uh, for saying the first item, we can we can see that if we have The following degeneration, uh, omega one uh, in p equal to omega two in p equal to zero. Well, we are considering forms of this way. I the shizum a uh, the x one plus B i the x two well so the thing that we can see here is that uh, well this is a degeneration because this uh, um, this is not satisfying this property and we can see that the codimension of this is equal to, to four. Well, that's because if we consider the, the parameters of, of, well, the, the parameter, the function parameters of each differential form, we have here A1, B1, A2, B2. Well, so for each, each parameter will will 
uh, will give us uh, one codimension. And if, if we um, analyze this whole, this, this situation for the parameters, we will get that the codimension of this, or which is defined by this property, has codimension four. And using the transversality theorem, we have that um, the set that um, satisfy this property is equal to empty. Well, so there are no points over the manifold such that satisfy this property. Well, so we get that the differential form are different for zero. And using um, the, um, how to say that, the, um, the rank nullity theorem and by the rank nullity theorem. We will get that the dimension of the kernel. Well, in this case, I will say this: the kernel of the one, the first one four, cap the kernel of the second is equal to the dimension of the tangent space. In this case, we are over two manifolds, so the tangent space is one. Hey, sorry, the, the dimension of the tangent space is two. Minus, uh, minus the dimension of the image, the image of this. But uh, as we, get, we have uh, one forms, the dimension of the image is equal to one. So we get that the dimension of this is equal to one. And the smoothing of this is because uh, we can change the, we can use the, the Darbu theorem for making a, a change of coordinates. And then uh, using again the transversality theorem, we can see uh, that property. Well, so the the thing that that I want was was this and uh, the way that we can use for for example the, the singularity theory for um, analyzing other um, other mathematical topics like. Uh, in this case, differential systems. So there are a lot of bridge between the between the the mathematical, the mathematical branches that we we say sometimes that they are not related to. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> Comment questions. Okay, okay, let's thank you again. Okay. So, just a, a very quick information about the payment. We already announced it to, would be uh, today, but uh, we try our best, sorry about that, but we were not able because uh, we needed to see, to check some information about the source. And, uh, but uh, for tomorrow it will be okay, okay, so we apologize for that. And also for the, we are especially uh, worried about this, uh, the, the group of students that, uh, you know, that came from abroad and uh, we were not, uh, maybe it would be hard to do an international transaction for that. But of course, uh, everyone will be paid tomorrow by cash. Okay. And sorry, we apologize for that. Okay. Uh, don't forget to take uh, uh, the package of meal. Okay. The snack, which is in the desk. Okay. On the desk. Bye. See you tomorrow.